In the late 17th century, an Englishman named Robert Hooke discovered a rather simple but important property of springs. He noticed, of course, that if you apply a force to a spring, uh, it causes it to stretch from its equilibrium length. And here uh, there is a downward force, which I'll label F, acting on this spring provided by gravity and it causes it to elongate or stretch by some distance labeled X. Hooke realized that if the force was exactly doubled, then the elongation was exactly doubled as well. The force of 2F leads to an elongation of 2X and a force of 3F, three times the original force, would cause an extension or elongation of 3X. He eventually published this result and it became known as Hooke's Law, one of his claims to fame. And it's written like this, the force acting on a spring is proportional to the stretch or elongation. And uh, a lot of times it's written as an equality, the force is equal to some constant k times x where k is called the spring constant, and it's a measure of the stiffness of the spring. People had a, a fairly easy time accepting this relationship. It seems pretty obvious once you think about it. But Hooke said, look, it doesn't apply just to springs. It applies to almost all solids. Um, metal, stones, glass, and bones. That rhymed. If you actually have a bone and you apply a force to it, it will stretch a little bit. You can think of the bonds between the molecules as being springs, and when you apply a force, you are stretching those bonds a very tiny amount. And the object, the bone, for example, does change its length. Now, it's difficult to see the change in the length of a bone or a piece of metal when you pull or push on it, but it actually does take place. You just need sophisticated equipment to detect something so small. Nowadays, we have that equipment. So here we have a piece of equipment called a universal testing system. And its purpose is to stretch or pull apart whatever you put inside its two grips. And here we see a sample of metal. And when this thing is turned on, the upper grip will pull upward and uh, stretch the material. It typically is designed to stretch it until the material fractures or breaks. And we can see right here a sample, I think this is aluminum, that broke this thing can generate enormous forces, so thousands of pounds of force, enough to actually stretch or break uh, metal. When you're using the piece of equipment, it can be difficult to see the stretch, but it actually does take place, and the equipment uses very sensitive sensors to detect how much it's stretching. If it's stretching by, say, less than a millimeter, you're unlikely to notice it with the naked eye, but it still does take place. Let's go back to Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law says that the harder you pull on an object, the more it stretches. Okay, And this piece of equipment is capable of measuring force and stretch. It applies a known force and measures the stretch that goes with that. However, most engineers are less interested in uh, the force than they are the force per unit area. They're typically more interested in the force per unit area. That is, the force pulling on this material divided by the cross-sectional area of this cylinder and, and that would be pi r squared, where r is the radius of this uh, cylinder. Okay, so typically the force is divided by the area, pi r squared, to obtain basically the pressure on the material.
Um, it's typically in units of PSI, pounds per square inch, pounds for force and square inches for area. And it's given the name, force per unit area, in this context is given the name stress. And so you will often hear engineers talk about the stress on a piece of material as opposed to the force. Uh, the two things are very closely related, as you can see. Okay. And instead of focusing on X, the amount by which the material stretches, so let's say we have a piece of material, and the length of that material is labeled L to little subscript 0. And when you pull on the material, it stretches a little bit x. x refers to just this tiny distance that it stretches. Um, engineers are typically more interested in the ratio of x to l than just x by itself. That is, what percentage has this increased in length? Okay, If x is 1 centimeter and l is 100 centimeters, then this has increased in length 1%. And that's a more significant quantity than x by itself. Because something that is a mile long that gets stretched 1 centimeter, well that's negligible, but something that is 2 centimeters long that gets stretched 1 centimeter, that's saying something. Right? So x alone doesn't tell you so much, but if you know x as a percentage of the total, then that gives you a better feel for how much the material elongated. So x divided by the original length of the material, uh, well that ratio is called strain. And stress and strain can be put into an equality if we introduce a constant, and the constant is E And the name of it is Young's modulus, also known as the modulus of elasticity. So stress equals Young's modulus times strain. Stress is proportional to strain. And because E is fixed, as a constant always is, if stress doubles, then so must strain. You can think of it this way. If I pull twice as hard on the material, it stretches twice as much. Okay, right along lines with Hooke's law. So this is Young's modulus, E. Okay, named after Thomas Young. I want you to think of stress equals E strain in terms of what the graph would look like. What if we put stress on the y-axis and strain on the x-axis? Here's the symbol for stress, which I haven't yet shown you. It's the Greek letter sigma. And the uh, abbreviation for strain is the Greek letter epsilon. And so I'm going to rewrite my equation here. Sigma equals E epsilon, stress equals Young's modulus times strain. And if we plot a bunch of points, that is, let's say this thing applies a stress of 100 pounds per square inch, 100 psi, and it, it stretches the thing 2%. We might uh, plot on the y-axis, uh, we would find 100, and on the x-axis we would find 2%, and we'd put a dot, right? And then if it pulled with a force of 200 PSI, we would expect an elongation of 4%, right? And, and what we find is that it's a, uh, a straight line. So the machine collects data. It measures stress at multiple points, um, one slightly higher than the other. And um, that is like a continually increasing stress, and it continually measures the strain associated with each stress, and it plots the points, and the output of this machine, because the machine is connected to a computer and it does give you a nice graph output, the output is this graph stress 
versus strain and and it does have a linear section typically and the linear section tells you that the material is obeying this equation and think about this the slope of the line is e because this is equivalent to writing y equals mx say plus b where b is zero this is the equation for a line sigma or stress is on the y-axis epsilon or strain is on the x-axis and e is our slope and it is fixed okay we could also write e this way e equals sigma over epsilon okay and this ratio is constant so right now we're not talking in terms of numbers well I guess we actually dead right so maybe uh, 100 psi over 2 percent so 2 percent is 0 0.02 so E is equal to this number you can see that E has units of psi as well because 0 0.02 doesn't have units so the units for Young's modulus are also pounds per square inch. So what if I took a different material that was stiffer than this first material and the machine ran its test and and gave us a graph would that graph be steeper or less steep than what we see right here for a stiffer material the answer of course would be it would be steeper stiffer materials have a steeper slope if you think of it down here it might take 200 psi to get the same 2 percent strain or maybe it takes 500 pounds per square inch to get a 2 percent strain okay E is bigger when it takes a larger stress to get some strain and right here, if I pick a particular strain, say 1%, okay, then I see that this stiffer material requires a much larger stress, like right here, than this less stiff material or more flexible material. You could also say for a given stress, like this stress right here, a stiffer material doesn't stretch as much as a more flexible material. Okay, this material might stretch at this particular stress five percent, whereas this one was, you know, one percent. So think about the slope of the line. The slope of the line indicates the stiffness of the material. This might be steel. This might be aluminum. What about a human hair? Human hair, less stiff, I would say, than aluminum. And so we'd probably get something like this. Uh, pretend that's straight. So this is hair. Okay. And it should be straight, and it would be less steep. It doesn't take much force or stress I should say to get maybe a 1% stretch okay and what about human skin human tissue in general is usually pretty flexible and so you could think about this right now or even try it if you pull on your skin it stretches quite a bit if you pulled equally hard on a piece of steel it would stretch a negligible amount you wouldn't even be able to see it so compared to steel, a little pull on skin has a, a much lower Young's modulus. Flex materials have a much lower Young's modulus. Very stiff materials have a very high Young's modulus. So this would be skin. Okay, so here are some realistic numbers. Young's modulus for piece of steel, typically about 30 million PSI. 
you look at this equation right here, if you set epsilon equal to one, which corresponds to a hundred percent strain, the thing is increasing its length 100%. That means it's doubling in length. Then E equals sigma over 1. Okay, if E is 30 million psi, then sigma would also be 30 million psi. Another way of thinking of Young's modulus, or the modulus of elasticity, as the stress that it would take to cause a 100% increase in strain or a doubling in length. So to double the length of a piece of steel, it takes 30 million pounds per square inch. That doesn't mean you typically pull on a piece of steel with 30 million pounds. You normally don't double the length of steel. A lot of times, material would break before it actually doubles in length. So maybe a piece of steel never actually experiences a force this great. But in theory, it would take this much force to double its length. Wood something like 2 million PSI. Diamond, much higher than steel, about 170 million PSI. So hopefully this gives you some idea as to what Young's modulus means, and you're now comfortable with the idea of stress, strain, and, and Young's modulus.